Y'all squeeze in real good. <laughs> the Lord be with you. Several years ago, I was on a radio program, used to be called The Protestant Hour. It's now called Day One. And Peter Wallace, who's the host of that program, and I were talking before, just sort of getting to know, I guess, me or whatever. And he said, uh, well, Chris, I, I read that you're the pastor of First Baptist Church of Williams, but it used to be called Ohatchee Creek Baptist Number 2. I said, yes, don't ask me where number one was. I said, yeah, we got an upgrade sometime in the 70s to First Baptist Church of Williams under some guy named John Tadlock, who was the longest interim pastor in the history of interim pastors from 1970 to 1978. Okay, so that's a little before my time. But I will say, as the longer I've been here, as I trace back certain things in our church, things that, if I'm honest with you, first attracted me to the First Baptist Church of Williams. While I think it's all woven into the DNA of this church, I always seem to find the epicenter of it somewhere around some guy named Tad. The first pastor, it seems, to really sort of push the church out onto a leading edge of sorts. Uh, a, a thoughtful, he paid me to say all these things, <laughs> a thoughtful pastor, one who will make you wonder, way, way out here in rural northeast, how is there a church like the First Baptist Church of Williams? And you can trace that all 168 years, but there really is a fulcrum around John Tadlock. He is, uh, I heard one person say, oh, Tad, yeah, he's BBF. I said, what's BBF? They said, before Bob Ford. <laughs> and friends, it's hard to find somebody before Bob Ford. So I say that, Bob, and all love. So, Tad, thank you for being here this morning. Welcome back. Well, good morning, saints. Good morning, sinners. We're all here. Well, this is absolutely an amazing experience for me to be here to see the church as it is today. And to see so many of you that, I, that used to be young. <laughs> and have you asked me, do you remember me? Let, me? let me tell you a little bit here about my memory. I really was diagnosed a couple years ago with mild cognitive impairment which means that I have an excuse for not remembering things. <laughs> and I've sort of outlived that and done some things that seem to, to go well, and, uh, and, and, and I'm pleased about that. But let me suggest that as you, some of you have done this morning, you've come to me and asked me, do you remember me? And what do I say? I say, of course. <laughs> and then let me ask you to do something. Tell me your name first and then ask me. <laughs> Because some of you really uh, have gotten old. <laughs> some of us have gotten old. It is wonderful to be here. I was so pleased last year that you were able to get Barry Howard to, to come in and take my place on a very short notice because of illness. And that illness, of course, continued through the years or through the year along with my wife, Lacey, who is not here. She has um, uh, lost her hearing. She, we thought she was losing her sight and pretty much one eye. That was true, but she got some uh, laser surgery. What was it, Kristen, last week? Uh, and where are you? Oh, our daughter, Kristen, is, was sitting with Bob there trying to make sure he doesn't get too rowdy. <laughs> and... Um, so she had that surgery and is seeing better. So we're pleased about that. There are a lot of other things. 
But some of you know that she was a music major when undergraduate years, and she got her master's degree at Jacksonville State when um, Charles Boozer offered her a job teaching uh, down in Mechanicsville. She lasted there for a while, then came out to Roy Webb, and she spent most of her years as an elementary school teacher there. Uh, but in music, when she hears a, a, an organ or a flute, she can't tell the difference between the two anymore. And that's kind of sad. Ambient noise of any kind is, is, a, is a problem for her. So we have a four-year-old grandson that when he and his six-year-old sister begin running around the house, he will come up, they call her Mams, he will come up to her and say, Mams, you need to take your ears off. <laughs> And she does. <laughs> but I was very pleased that Barry was able to do this. And, and as I say, we've had our problems, as you have, the aging process and, and all of this. I had, I'm a proud owner of an AICD pacemaker defibrillator uh, in 1990. I had a hip replacement. I'm going to have to have some work done on it. There was no place to, to, to grease it up or anything like that to keep it going. So they've got to go in there and do something else. Um, how many of you have diabetes, type 2, kind of like that? I got that too. So. <laughs> Metformin is a regular thing for me, uh, twice a day, um, and um, a few other things. And so, so much so that there was so much happening to Lacey and to me that I just started feeling a little bit like Job. You know, and there was one day that I lifted my hollow eyes toward heaven and asked the Lord, why me? Why are you putting me through this? And I heard this voice sounding, well, because, Ted, there's just something about you that irks me. <laughs> well, here we are on All Saints Sunday, and we're talking about being kinfolk, and I want us to begin with this text today, which is in the Revised Common Lectionary. I'm pleased to know that, that Chris follows that, and uh, really it's a wonderful way to keep up. And I want to read from Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 34, and I invite you to Follow along in your Bible, and, or, or just simply to listen. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, Which commandment is the first of all? And Jesus answered, The first is this, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Ehad. Would you like to know how to say that? That's the Hebrew for the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Then he went on to say, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And then the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is the one. He is the one. And besides him, there is no other. And to love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, and with all your strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself. This is much more important than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any questions. This is the word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, here we are on All Saints Sunday, 
more perhaps than any other day of the year. It's a day when we get out, go get out all of our photograph albums and begin to take a look at all the people who might be in them. Who do we see in those albums? Now, if you're really serious about this, you may look and see some of the older folks. You might, for example, find St. Francis standing in barefoot in, in the snow with, with birds on his shoulders and perhaps his pet wolf by his side. Or maybe you will find Joan of Arc, who, who led men twice her size into battle. She was criticized for preferring body armor to wearing petticoats. And she puzzled everyone by dressing like a man. But the voices of the critics were nothing compared to the voice of God in her mind and in her heart. If you keep turning the pager, pages in that album, you come across perhaps less famous persons whom we might call saints in our ancestry. And, but, but no less intriguing. For example, there is Saint Maximilian, who's the first conscientious objector, who refused the, to be called into the, the military service by the, the Roman leader, the Roman army. And he said that his only loyalty was to the army of God. Now, his father, who was a veteran, knew that this meant death for his son. And at his beheading, Maximilian noticed the shabby clothing of his executioner. And then he called his father and said, Father, please take my good clothing off and give it. To him. Similar story is about St. James, the brother of John, who also was canonized as, as a saint. He was so full of grace on his way to death that the guard assigned to him fell on his knees and confessed his faith in God through Jesus Christ. James raised him up by the hand, kissed him on the cheek, and he said, peace be with you. Then both men were executed together. But at their last exchange, like the sweet smell of honeysuckles in the spring air, lives on in the exchange of peace that, that we observe in our congregations and between each other to this day. The peace of the Lord be always with you. But I think one of the things that intrigues me the most is to understand that these were people who were not sitting around quoting scripture, reading theology, sounding holy. They weren't sitting around waiting for an opening in the Trinity. They were simply making themselves available to God as they were. There were no goody goodies here. In fact, legend has it that St. Francis rolled naked in the snow in order to defend himself against his, shall we say, rather lusty thoughts. St. Mary of Egypt, a patron saint of, of, of actually the penitents, was, was a prostitute for 17 years until she came to Christ and then became a desert ascetic mother for 50 years. St. Bernard of Clairvaux, that 12th century monk who talked a lot about the different kinds of love from the lowest kind to the highest kind, was one of the organizers of the second, uh, the, 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 the second time that they, that they went after the Christians and others 
of the, in, in that crusade that didn't come out very well. In fact, it collapsed into an orgy of pillage and looting. Okay, here's my point. It actually helps me to understand that these saints are not distinguished by their purity or their goodness or their holy holiness. They're not distinguished by this. They, they were distinguished rather by their extravagant love for God as it was revealed in the way they made that love available to persons given to them every day in their path, regardless of who they were. They're, these were ordinary women and men whose love for God leads them to do extraordinary things, which means frail children of dust that we are, that sainthood, sainthood may not be beyond your reach. Gene, you might gain that someday. Marilyn, of course, we know that already. These were ordinary people with extraordinary presence. But not all of them were distinguished. Have you ever heard of Absalom Jones, anybody? Absalom Jones? Nobody. Well, that's not unusual. I hadn't heard of Absalom Jones either until I attended last week a gathering of clergy who were invited to participate in a dialogue with Barbara Brown Taylor, one of my all-time favorite priests, Episcopal background and, and, uh, and preacher, wonderful preacher. And we were there to dialogue. She's going to present something in dialogue. And she talked about Absalom Jones. Never heard of Absalom Jones. Uh, and so I, I asked her if I could use this in my sermon after I improved on it a little. I did so with, with permission. I'm doing so. Because my greatest ambition still is to have an original idea. <laughs> she told us about Jones, born as a house slave in Delaware in 1748. And he taught himself how to read by reading the New Testament. And he was eventually sold to a shopkeeper in Philadelphia. There he went to night school run by the Quakers and he married another uh, slave who, whose freedom he bought with the savings that he had earned. Eighteen years later, he was able to do the same thing for himself and he became a lay minister for a black membership, for the black membership at the St. George's Methodist Episcopal Church in Philadelphia. And he brought so many black worshipers into the congregation that the vestry, or you might call them deacons, were alarmed. And so they voted to confine these black folks to the balconies in the back and all around. They couldn't come in, into the main part of the sanctuary, the nave. So you can find them there. Now, Absalom Jones was not told that. And the next Sunday when he showed up for worship, he sat in his usual place in the sanctuary. When an usher came and with great anger said to him, you can't sit here, you have to leave, you have to go to the balcony. Well, the inevitable result was that they, he and every black person in that church left the congregation, left that church, started their own church, and with, within less than a year, they had 500 members who were coming to worship every Sunday. She also told about a woman named Constance. Constance and her companions. It's a group of nuns from, from, from New England who had gone to Memphis, and they had arrived in Memphis more than Five years, had been there more than five years when the yellow fever attacked, swept through the city for the third time in a decade. More than half of the people 
in Memphis left because they were afraid. Of course, when the sickness started, but Constance and her companions stayed put. Soothing, and die, uh, soothing the dying with their Yankee New England accents, placing wet cloths on their burning foreheads, emptying bedpans filled with contagion. Constance and her companions stayed. Now, I don't know whether they were thinking that because they were doing this, God would protect them from, their, from the same illness. But let me say to you, I don't think they were thinking about themselves at all. Because there, if you go to Memphis today, there's a, there's, in the Elmwood Cemetery, there is a fairly large round marker listed with all of the names of those people who stayed and helped. There are others, aren't there? Are there other saints? I'd list, of course. One of the most important ones to me would, would be Nelson Mandela. He's not been sanctified in any way. But let me tell you, what he did was absolutely amazing as the primary person to eliminate apartheid. And I still have problems, just as we do in this country, but he did that. In 2005, I was invited to lead a retreat for pastors and wives in South Africa. And we did that, but after that, the most important thing that we did was to, was to fly, Lacey and I flew to Cape Town. Then we took a boat ride out to Robben Island. Robben Island is the prison that Mandela and his cohorts spent. Mandela spent 18 years of his 27 year incarceration in that island. Now I want to tell you something. Walking into his cell and looking through that iron bars, you could see when it was light, you could see Cape Town. And you could see Table Rock. But what, what, was my imag what was in my imagination, as we walked around that prison, as we went to the place where they, they did their work in the pits, the dirt pits, the rock pits, and in the other areas there, when I walked around that place, Folks, it felt like holy ground. Because it was. Mandela died almost, well, let's say almost five years ago, December the 5th, 2013. But it would be a mistake to assume that you got to be dead to be a saint. Unfortunately, that is true with the Roman Catholic Church. But the truth is that there are living saints all over the place, and a lot of them have been through here. And a lot of them are here now. But let me tell you about one, Osceola McCarty. Anybody hear of her, Osceola McCarty? Well, good. This is another one that I knew about because she's from my home state, Mississippi. She's from Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And I didn't know she was a saint until about 1998. She certainly didn't look like one. Her job was washing clothes. Uh, she, was, she was an old black woman who, who had never married. She dropped out of school when she was 12 years old in, in the sixth grade to begin a lifetime of washing clothes, helping her mother and helping her grandmother with that job as they took care of a very sick aunt. And she was sick for about a year and then she left. For the next 75 years, she decided she was not going back to school because she said she was too big. And she didn't go back to school. She dropped out then. And for the next 75 years, that was what she did, scrubbing the dark clothes on that, that uh, washboard. You all know what a washboard is, some of you. And boiling the white ones in a big black pot. And we did that, but we later used it for boiled peanuts and good parties. Then before she did that, before they hung them out to dry. And then she, 
She worked from sunup to sundown, and it was not until she was 87 years of age that, that anyone fully knew who she was. That was when she gave $150,000 to the University of Southern Mississippi in Hattiesburg to provide scholarships for African American students. Other businesses heard about that and money started pouring in and right now that endowment is worth millions. But she started all, uh, all of it. And she was sort of ordinary, right? Now, let me just tell you, it's past 11 o'clock. I don't have long. I'm near the ending. And for those who are already wishing Bob Ford was preaching. <laughs> I want to make an announcement. I like, to, I like to do this. I like to notify people if I'm going to say something profound. Just in case you've already tuned out. This is it. We are here on All Saints Sunday, and I want to make a very bold claim that if there is only one God, as our text says, we're all kinfolks. Every person on earth is a sister or brother. God loves the people we may hate just as much as God loves us. All these people are kin. We have the same blood running in our veins. Christ's blood, if we have chosen to follow Him. And that means when we read this text about, about loving our neighbor, we don't have the luxury of asking who is it that qualifies to be neighbor. The question is this, to whom am I to be a neighbor every day? Just, just remember, you don't have to be famous, you don't have to be perfect, you don't have to be dead. You just have to be you. You have to be the unique one of a kind you, becoming the one that God loved to throw your arms around the world with you to shine like the sun. And I can almost hear the many who have been here at Williams calling your name and shouting themselves hoarse with encouragement, indicating all of us are bound together by that miraculously adhesive quality of a profound faith in God and love for others. Remember the Shema, Hear, O Israel, that we quoted earlier. Well, don't miss out on the next thing it says. And whatever Moses said when he told the Hebrews in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. In fact, what he said, he said in, 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 in Deuteronomy 6, that these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. That's what he said. They're to be on your hearts. Impress them upon your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them to your foreheads. Write them in the door frames of your houses and on your great, uh, gates. Embed them in your lives. Father Damien was a Roman Catholic priest from Belgium. He went to Hawaii to become a missionary, and he ended up as a missionary in a leper colony. And when he, as their priest, would stand and deliver his homily to them, he would start preaching this way, you lepers. He had been there so long, he had invested his life in them so deeply 
in, in everything they did that very soon after he started preaching his homily, he would use the words, we lepers. Amen.